This video is a sequel to our Anno 1800 Season 2 Pass review. Please watch that video first for a review on the previous year's DLC offerings. We also have our Anno 1800 Year In review which covered the base game and the Season 1 Pass. Anno 1800 has completed its third season of post-release development since its 2018 release, introducing another round of DLC expansion, cosmetic packs, and accompanying patches to further enhance this already content-heavy game into breathtaking new heights, figuratively and literally as we will come to see. This review will analyze each of those DLCs, evaluate the Season 3 pass as a whole, and conclude Anno 1800's overall state and standing after 2021. This is Anno 1800, the Season 3 pass review. Season 3 was announced relatively quickly after the final DLC of Season 2, Land of Lions. By this point, many thought that the game had reached a state of critical mass, with up to 5 regions to juggle with, hours of story content to play through, and plenty of mechanical depth to tinker with endlessly. With this in mind, developers Ubisoft Bluebyte made it explicitly clear that the third season would not introduce any New World sessions, in an effort to not introduce more bloat and needless complexity, despite the beautiful settings that were covered in the previous two seasons. Although there was a lot of demand for an expansion into Asia, of which the continent had much influence on European affairs in the 1800s, the developers decided to pivot Season 3 to streamlining and optimizing the experience in the Old World the starting home region of the player, including Cape Trelawney as well, introduced in the Sunken Treasures DLC. The framework for this would be the expansion of gameplay mechanics to encompass three core themes centered within the Old World region. The harbor was revitalized and expanded with the Docklands DLC, released in February of 2021. Tourism received a brighter spotlight in the Tourist Season DLC launched in May of 2021, whilst the Metropolis is hoisted to the skies with the High Life DLC of August 2021. In December of 2021, a special Plant a Tree DLC and new scenario mode, Eden Burning, was also launched as part of Anno 1800's contribution to the United Nations Play for Forest campaign to help protect forests worldwide. This DLC is not part of the Season 3 pass, and the scenario is a free update for all players, but we will cover this content as well. There were also a variety of cosmetic packs released in the 2021 third season, and this will be showcased in various degrees throughout the footage in this video, but since they are just purely visual cosmetics and do not add anything to the gameplay, we will not be explicitly covering them in this review. The two major concepts of the Docklands DLC are focused on the extension of the harbour area through new buildings and cosmetics, and mechanics to support the late game optimization of resources. This is enabled with the new Docklands modular harbour building. Each island can place a Docklands main wharf, unlocked at 250 artisans. It serves as an all-in-one loading port plus harbour master's office, which can serve as another place for ships to dock and to equip items, but similar to the palace in the Seat of Power DLC, is meant to be supported by a variety of smaller modular pieces, providing a structured, expandable yet flexible set of options to enhance the harbour area. Depots increase the island's total storage, piers add extra harbour slots for ships to trade with, repair cranes repair any nearby ships, harbour masters add an extra item slot, loading wharves reduce the loading times for ships in the area, and exports offices increases the amount of trade contracts available in the export and import mechanic. That addition of the export and import mechanic is the main mechanical feature for the Docklands DLC. Here players can import certain goods by exporting their own. Captain Tobias and his trade ship will arrive every 20 minutes to fulfill the created trade contracts. He is essentially the ferryman connecting the player to the global goods market. In the initial stages of the session, this is very useful for either procuring emergency resources that you may lack in the short term, whilst selling off excess resources that are perhaps being overproduced. 
However, the export-import mechanic is deceptively much deeper in scope if the player so chooses to dwell a little further. There's two sides to this coin. First of all, every resource has a certain value on the trade market. More easily produced goods are cheaper in value, of course, requiring more amounts to trade against rarer resources that carry much more worth. For instance, the ratio between fish against importing fur coats is about 7 to 1, meaning you need 7 tons of fish to trade for a ton of fur. I do recommend having a look at the Anno 1800 wiki. This is really handy here for a full breakdown of all the import multipliers. These ratios can get improved, however, if the player chooses to specialize in certain goods. Exporting a large number of that resource improves its corresponding exchange value. So even if initially the exchange ratio is measly, over time it can improve to garner much more worth and thus be exchanged for greater amounts of import goods. Say you're producing a lot of champagne, a common item to accrue a large stockpile of in the temperate regions given its ESA production. You can instead trade that for something that is quite needed by the general population yet more difficult to produce and transport. Chocolate is a good example of this. At first the trade ratio isn't that great and you will essentially be trading 1.2 tons of champagne for every ton of chocolate. But exporting at least a thousand tons of champagne over time will advance it to a tier 4 specialty good, improving its exchange ratio to 1.2 times its base ratio. Advancing it to a tier 3 good by exporting 2500 total tons improves its ratio to 1.4 times, all the way to tier 1 or a golden export, which brings in 2 times the base ratio. There are a total of 10 slots for 10 different goods the player can focus on as their specialty exports with varying degrees on this tier pyramid. In my own session, as an example, I decided to focus heavily on producing gold because of its already great base multiplier, eventually becoming my tier one specialty export, using its exceptional ratio to buy late game luxuries and furnishings for extremely lucrative margins, such as steam carriages, jewelry, or cigars. At this point, I didn't even need to produce any of those later goods because I was capable of importing so much of them. The other side of the coin are the list of companies that can be traded with on the global market. Most of the resources in the game across all the DLCs are available here, so the player can virtually import almost anything they desire, though more advanced goods are locked behind progression gates. For instance, to start importing coffee, you must first import a certain amount of chocolate, and to import chocolate, you need to first import a certain amount of plantains. The overall export-import mechanic is extremely nicely designed. In the early game, it allows the player to sell off excess resources and import emergency supplies. In the late game, it provides an opportunity to streamline production chains and optimize space. The player can overproduce a small amount of goods and import the rest of their necessities, pretty much what actual countries still do on the global trade market to this day. It also facilitates the circumvention of producing late game goods that require intense setups such as goods from Inbessa that need to be produced on that continent then transported to the old world for scholars. Destroy those Inbessa production chains, clear out the trade routes and forget about excessive micromanagement, just export them. Despite a pretty steep learning curve, in my opinion, it essentially makes the game way easier and way more streamlined. At the same time, however, it is a completely optional mechanic. Players can min-max the export-import mechanics heavily to import the majority of their resource needs, or they can just simply opt in when necessary, dabbling with a bit of importing out of necessity, and produce the majority of their resources at home. A new ship type is also included with this DLC, the World Class Reefer. It has 6 cargo slots, but only 1 item slot. However, its unique trait is that it travels twice as fast between regions, making it a particularly astute ship for New World to Old World transportation routes. The ship is unlocked upon the completion of the Deep Blue questline, which appears upon the first resource reaching the highest specialty tier. This is a very quick and easy quest that involves helping Captain Tobias find a last-of-its-kind great white shark that he has nicknamed Deep Blue. The spotting of the shark has attracted several poachers that wish to hunt down the fabled creature, so the player must escort the shark out of the map and fend off enemy vessels. Tobias then gives you the blueprints to the world-class reefer as a reward. And that's it, there's clearly not much story content or world building to be found here. 
Finally, included with this DLC are a set of 25 harbour ornaments that supports the Docklands aesthetic and useful to decorate the various seaside keys and berths that accompany construction of the Docklands main wharf and its modular buildings. These work very well with the new features added in the supporting game update 10, the highlight of which allows harbour buildings to be built in open water and connected to land with the Key Street. As a result, players can move their fisheries and sand mines off the beach to save even more space. I do have one gripe with this update in that it didn't add any open water warehouses, so any industries built in these harbour areas still need to be reasonably close to the land restricted warehouses. Docklands is an extremely well thought out DLC concept, but will unfortunately be quite irrelevant to some players as the mileage will vary. Instead, it's for the Anno 1800 veterans that wish to utilize another optimization and specialization tool for min-maxing their late game production chains. There is an interesting dynamic with the tourist season DLC though, the ability to import exotic goods for restaurants, and that's something we'll cover later. I wish there was some more depth with the global trade companies though, such as fluctuating market prices for imports, like how it was done in the world market of Anno 2205, to encourage the player to reconsider their trade contracts depending on the ever-changing price of commodities. Pure playable content is also lacking. Players after a storied mission sequence like in Land of Lions or The Passage will be disappointed. The addition of the modular docks and the harbour themed ornaments do provide a breath of fresh salty sea air to the harbour area aesthetic, certainly lacking from the base game. Lighthouses for instance are a welcome addition. But again, players who wish to maintain their pristine sandy shorelines will however have little use, so definitely a DLC that can be skipped if you have little interest in building an industrial docklands district for your city, or you don't need the export and import trade mechanics. Tourist Season DLC is an interesting premise that introduces new gameplay elements for a previously underdeveloped mechanic of the base game. Tourism before this season was simply a case of building a public mooring, allowing visitors to arrive on that island and explore around, generating an extra source of income based on the island's attractiveness level. With this DLC activated, upon reaching 500 engineers, the public mooring can then be upgraded to the tourist mooring. It operates pretty similarly to the previous level, as the entry point of tourists and where random specialists may also arrive, but it's also the first basic need of the new tourist residential tier. Unlike visitors who are essentially day trippers, tourists become a subset of the old world population with their own separate needs, luxuries and associated mechanics. The hotel is a new building introduced to accommodate them. It has the capability to cater to a maximum of 500 tourists, so you will need multiple of them to reach the advanced stages of this DLC content. At least 8 of them in fact to unlock everything. The building blueprints are quite large as well, so you'll need a considerable amount of space in order to house the maximum potential amount of tourists. The tourists themselves require a few basic starting needs. They first require an obvious connection to the tourist mooring. Now this can be achieved by placing hotels near the tourist mooring, but with the bus stop mechanic we'll cover in just a bit, it's not a necessity to place them directly near each other. Tourists also require bread and variety theatre access, again not necessarily nearby. The rest of the needs are self-explanatory and interlinked with the content of the DLC which we'll cover as we proceed further. Tourists also have a happiness that is based on mostly the availability of luxury goods and access to many of the attraction hotspots around your city. The key thing to note is that tourists are disproportionately affected by negative newspaper articles and the state of war in particular, reducing the maximum cap of tourists that will come to the island. So in order to connect the tourists to their needs buildings and attractions that they visit, bus stops need to be constructed. Bus stops close by to one another will form a network, so players should definitely place them quite uncompromisingly to cover as much of their city attractions as possible, especially if many of said attractions are in different areas around your city. 
So this is here is a great mechanic to provide tourist access to the mooring without hotels placed nearby as long as there are bus stops at each respective location. Similarly, variety theatres don't have to be in the same district as the hotel as long as there is a bus connection to it. This applies to all of the tourist attractions. Bus stops should be built at zoos, museums, and the World's Fair. Even attractions added through other DLCs, such as botanical gardens, the palace, and docklands count, and the skyline tower of the High Life DLC. So plan accordingly if you buy the full season pass package. Also, you can name the bus stops to give some more identity to each district of your city. The majority of tourist needs involve restaurants, cafes and bars, which essentially play the same role mechanically. Instead of a typical production building that produces a good, these buildings intake three ingredients and provide an area buff around a building, providing the associated need for tourists but also increasing happiness and reducing consumption of specific goods for the city's home population. They are sort of a combination of a tourist attraction and civil feeding station that helps to offset the food consumption of the populace. Each restaurant, cafe and bar has five different recipes to choose from, with later ones requiring some prerequisite the player must do first, which is still simple enough really. The main quest line allows the player to design new recipes and unlock them for these As buildings, the or fail miserably at them. It's all wrong. The texture, the flavor, the fragrance. It's nothing like I had expected. Each recipe has different ingredients and types of goods reduced, so there can be some strategic planning and placement here in different districts of your city. Just make sure to place a bus stop nearby so tourists can also get to them. Many recipes will require new exotic ingredients introduced with the DLC, or must be sourced from different regions of the world, such as caribou meat. This is where interactivity with the Docklands DLC is also useful as you don't technically have to construct an entire chain and ship it over from the Arctic, you can just import it. Tourist Season also introduces a new monument, a multi-stage construction project that results in an architectural marvel for your city, the Iron Tower. Again, this massive building will also gobble up more prime real estate and the DLC questline will also tell you to build a hotel and other amenities around it, so you're probably gonna need to move around a few things. Oh yeah, don't forget to put a bus stop here as well since this is also a need of the tourist. Once completed, you realize the Iron Tower is actually a food and drink venue with its own set of ingredients, recipes and goods consumption reduction bonuses. However, it has a stronger ability by giving a plus one bonus population to all residents. Furthermore, there's a slider here to assign tourists to the Iron Tower, which increases the range of the buffs provided. So if you have a sizable population of tourists, you can confer a substantial population boost and consumption reduction to an immensely large radius around your city. Though this doesn't stack with buffs from restaurants, cafes and bars as those take priority. I've always enjoyed the monument building aspect of Anno games as it feels satisfying to complete them and the Iron Tower adds a fairly iconic architectural piece to the city. I mean, who wouldn't want their own Eiffel Tower? To support the introduction of the tourism industry in this DLC, a new building type called multi-factories are added. Unlike other production buildings, the concept of multi-factories is all about flexibility. They can switch their recipes and produce a variety of products at will. This mostly synergizes with restaurants, cafes and bars, which also can switch their recipe types and thus require different ingredients. The Orchid is the most basic multi-factory and plays similarly to a hunting cabin or lumberjack's hut, growing the Orchid crops around it in a radius. In tourist season, they are used to produce jam in the old world or either cinnamon, coconut oil, citrus or camphor wax in the new world. Each of these ingredients used in varying degrees across the new production chains. The chemical plant is the other multi-factory introduced with tourist season. They require three ingredient inputs and are expensive to build and maintain, but are required to make shampoo a need of the tourists, or lemonade and souvenirs a luxury of tourists. Although it is a cool concept to improve flexibility by providing the capability to adjust production lines quickly as the player sees fit, 
I don't often have the time to micromanage such things and simply build multiple of them anyway for each of the products. I think that the multi-factory concept could have potential to synergize exceptionally well with the Docklands DLC in the future if more products were able to be made here. But right now, it's sort of a niche, underutilized idea. Multi-factories do reprise a greater role in the High Life DLC though. Tourist Season DLC also brings to the game 22 new ornaments, and I was pleasantly surprised by the quality and variety offered here, from the beautiful cherry tree to musician stages, signposts and maps to inform your tourists, vendors, kiosks, shops and other attractions to provide substantial allure to any holiday going area. Game Update 11 featured a lot of quality of life improvements, a half speed mode to play in slow motion, a new brush tool to regrow wild trees, great for reforesting the island, queuing up development of items or discoveries in the research center, and a new quest line in Mbessa are some of the highlights of this patch. Tourist season feels much more interactive and meaningful to your city as it expands on an element of the game which felt underdeveloped, as opposed to Docklands which is more optional and lacking in raw content. Tourist season features a much more linear, progressive story and questline that also acts as a tutorial so the learning curve is more easily understood. The new buildings and ornaments really allow players to develop a flavorful tourist area, but one major criticism is the lack of cosmetically different hotels, restaurants, cafes and bars. I would have loved to have seen more skins or customizable appearances for the buildings because they pretty much all look exactly the same. Regardless, the whole premise and idea of this DLC was definitely needed and will be appreciated as appeasing tourists should be a fundamental part of any city builder. Its execution by the developers is therefore appreciably very strong. Ever felt like after playing this game for hours upon hours through multiple sessions only for your cities, especially your crown jewel on Cape Trelawney to feel a bit cramped and space lacking? Well, this is the exact DLC for you. The High Life DLC is all about going vertical, providing the opportunity to accommodate more population per housing block than ever before. This is done through skyscrapers, which is unlocked after reaching 5,000 investors. Skyscrapers are available to upgrade existing engineer or investor residences with a maximum of three skyscraper levels available for engineers and up to five levels for investors. Each level or skyscraper upgraded houses more and more people, but comes at the cost of requiring new needs that the DLC also introduces. Furthermore, there is a new mechanic to sort of discourage upgrading everything to the max and have different skyscraper levels across your city, dubbed the panorama effect. Residents within skyscrapers like to have a panoramic view of the city. By keeping skyscrapers free from being surrounded by other taller or similar height skyscrapers in the vicinity, whilst building more lower level skyscrapers around it, more residents are encouraged to live here and consequently the increased income. I haven't quite figured out the truly optimal method for my city, but I like having a checkerboard pattern of tall and shorter skyscrapers to provide intense panoramic experiences for every second or so apartment complex. In general, you want a staggered design, but it's pretty cool how this mechanic will let players test out their own different configurations in their cities. Like the Tourist Season DLC, the High Life also dips heavily into utilizing the multi-factory mechanic, such as reusing the chemical plants. In this DLC, there's a few New World restricted production chains such as chewing gum or ethanol, in turn used to make lacquer and celluloid, intermediary goods for producing advanced products. Assembly lines are a new multi-factory introduced in this expansion, used to build elevators, a building material required in the construction of skyscrapers, and biscuits or typewriters, another required need for the skyscraper inhabiting citizens. This is where multi-factories exhibit their best potential, as you're not going to need an endless supply of elevators, so you can switch the factory to producing other goods between periods of skyscraper construction and downtime. 
The Artisans Workshop uses the intermediary goods from the former two multi-factories to produce the most advanced and complex products for your engineers and investors, required at the highest skyscraper levels, such as cognac, billiards tables, violins and toys. As a result, one can see the increased complexity of producing resources that comes with this DLC, as you will need much investment into the new world and extra transportation. It is thus a wish for the future that some of these goods should be able to be imported through the Docklands mechanic. A new set of city buildings are shopping arcades. They perform a similar function to restaurants, cafes and bars from the tourist season DLC, in which ingredients are used to manufacture products for skyscraper citizens to purchase, generating a goods consumption reduction to an area around it. And here, instead of different recipes, different patents can be applied to appease the consumerism of your apartment dwellers. Similar to unlocking recipes in tourist season, the quest lines will take you through unlocking a few basic patents, but most will require some sort of player-induced prerequisite. The department store sells an assortment of household appliances and are required as a basic need for engineer and investor skyscrapers selling toasters or vacuum cleaners or crockery. The furniture store is required by Engineer Skyscraper Level 2 and Investor Skyscraper Level 3. It sells such things as desks, lounges and bedroom furnishings. The drug store is required by Level 3 engineers and Level 5 investors, selling toothpaste, detergents and a host of other questionable 19th century chemical compounds. Again, the addition of shopping arcades is a very cool mechanic and enriching to the bustling consumerism of real life cities that propped up during the European 19th century. But the lack of adjustable visual aesthetic is shown here again as all the stores feature the same recolored model. Once you reach 25 level 5 skyscrapers, the associated quest line will allow players to start the construction of a skyline tower a new monument that sort of resembles New York's Empire State Building. This is a super expensive construction effort. It will set you back a cool 1.5 million credits, and because each stage will require more and more level 5 skyscrapers, in fact you'll need 75 fully upgraded skyscrapers for the final stage. Upgrading that many skyscrapers tends to need a lot of building materials and also the resource constraints as more and more investors flood into your city requiring a reassessment of all your current production chains. And like all mega building projects, this one has its own fair share of engineering mishaps that the player will need to resolve. After it's completed, you can dedicate the tower to a permanent bonus of your choosing. Though I don't really know what's stopping you from choosing the last and best option. The Skyline Tower Monument is essentially a mega apartment complex to house a whopping 4,000 investors. And depending on the surrounding access to shopping opportunities, the tower can further house a bonus amount of residents that live without consuming any resources. Talk about space efficiency. As a result, the Skyline Tower is the ultimate construction opportunity to house an immense amount of investors and thus bring in that enormous income and influence bonus for the ultra late game. But beware that this naturally results in more resource constraints. The Skyline Tower is also a tourist need if you have tourist season DLC, so be sure to place a bus stop nearby. Finally, the High Life DLC comes with a set of 10 ornaments. Only 10, however, a bit disappointing given other DLCs usually have at least 20. The addition of spotlights, large and small, are marvelous though, great at beaming up tall monuments in your city at night, such as the Skyline Tower or the Iron Tower. Game Update 12 was a bit lighter on content, but with no less quality. Some highlights include a multi-downgrade tool with the Alt key, collapsible trading post UI to view more goods at once, and bus skins, customizable at the bus stop from the previous expansion. So that's the High Life DLC. There's really not much of a steep learning curve or deep mechanic here, or novelty in fact, since it follows virtually the same formula as Tourist Season DLC. But this concept does address an increasingly relevant issue in everyone's Anno 1800 session, and in every high density urban area of the world. How do we cram more people into the least amount of space? The High Life DLC is thus an obvious but no less elegant solution to accommodating more engineers and investors, arguably the biggest resource and space constraint of the ultra late game.
Anno1800 was a participant of the 2021 Green Game Jam, an initiative of the Play for Forest campaign by the United Nations, whereby an activity or a new game mode was added to betray the fight for climate change. Eden Burning, a free scenario added with Update 13, is an enticing new game mode that provides immense potential for future non-sandbox content. This was supported alongside a cosmetic DLC, the Plant a Tree DLC, with all proceeds forwarded to charities fighting climate change. It adds the majestic Saber Tree ornament for your cities. The scenario is a new concept being explored by the developers of Anno 1800, which previously had revolved around only its story campaign and sandbox mode. Here, the player must accomplish set objectives under certain conditions and be rewarded depending on their performance. The scenario system is looking to be expanded further by the developers in Season 4, as stated in their December 2021 dev blog. The scenario puts players into the shoes of Isabel Sarmento, in charge of revitalizing the new world island La Zortuna after its recapture from the Porphyrians. Many of their industrial assets are still present on the island, polluting the air, water and earth, of which much of the population depends on for their food and electricity supply. However, the citizens of the island desire a greener, sustainable, long-term solution to their ecological and energy crisis, proposing a hydroelectric dam construction. The player, as Isabel, must construct this ambitious project, clear out the polluting ruins of the Porphyrians, whilst maintaining the delicate ecosystem and reduce exploitation of the island's limited resources. This scenario introduces interesting mechanics and buildings that are substantially more difficult than sandbox mode and have potential for a very interesting, realistic challenge style mode for the future. This includes finite resources for fisheries, forestry and minerals. For instance, the coastal fisheries must be built near known fishing shoals, and these are depleted slowly, eventually requiring a transition to land-based aquaponics. Lumberjack huts slowly tear down the forest, and forestry huts must be built to replenish it. Mines have a finite yield and must be expanded further or abandoned once depleted. The pollution system of the Eden Burning scenario harkens back to the eco-balance mechanic of Anno 2070. In this mode, the quality of the air, water and soil must be juggled and balanced by the player. For instance, building industry slowly degrades air quality, resulting in more and more environmental events that can hamper productivity and population health, let it slide too far and devastating acid rain can occur. In order to compensate this balance, the forest of the island should be maintained and expanded to filter out the air. Planting too many of the same crops on the island can degrade soil quality and productivity through the monoculture effect. Farming too many animals causes waste runoff, degrading water quality. These are some of the things the player must be wary of to try to limit or at least counteract in this scenario. The central objective of the scenario is to build the Hydroelectric Dam, a multi-stage construction project to deliver green power to the island. This harkens back to the region-specific monuments from Anno 2205, where different maps have a final goal the player tries to achieve, providing a large global boost to the progress of the player. A Hydroelectric Dam is an amazing idea for the base Anno 1800. Maybe in a future update, a set number of New World Islands can spawn with a river slot to build a Hydroelectric Dam, especially given their historical relevance where they did begin to appear especially around the early 20th century, such as the Hoover Dam. Finishing the dam project rewards the player with a tree ornament, either bronze, silver or gold depending on their performance. To achieve gold, one must keep island health above 80% whilst finishing the dam construction in less than 2 hours and 30 minutes. Good luck, it is definitely no easy feat. I quite enjoyed the first scenario. It was different enough from the base gameplay loop where it flexed some creative and strategic muscles, yet challenging enough to offer replayability. I'm quite excited for what scenarios may come into Anno 1800 in the future and relish the opportunity for some of those mechanics to make it into the game as a challenge mode sandbox option. Docklands is a niche DLC aimed at the super optimizers or veterans who want more options in specialization of their production lines. 
Out of all the DLCs thus far, it is the least required to the Anno 1800 experience, so I'd say it's a skip for most players. Tourist Season expands upon a popular and rather underdeveloped mechanic of the base game, bringing interesting conceptual and ornamental additions. Many players will relish the opportunity to play with tourists and build the Iron Tower, a very solid 8 out of 10 and my favourite DLC of this season. The High Life brings skyscrapers and the awe-inspiring Skyline Tower, but its content is most enjoyed at the ultra-late portion of the game, so its relevance is diminished. Furthermore, it does come with increased complexity which may be unforgiving to casual players. Although Season 3 Pass is slightly cheaper than previous seasons, I honestly think the whole package is not an essential buy, and I think there is a consideration for only buying one or two of these DLCs and playing at your own pace. So yeah, I'd rate the value and relevance of this Season 3 Pass less than the previous seasons, a 7 out of 10. So, it's apparent with our analysis to see the direction Ubisoft Blue Byte has taken with their 2021 third season. There's considerably less ambitious content with a focus on cheaper, more optional DLCs centered on old world mechanics. The previous seasons featured DLCs that are pretty much quintessential. Sunken Depths, new Cape Trelawney region for its massive building space, Bright Harvest for its agricultural revolution, Land of Lions for its scholar and research institute, to name a few. Despite these comparisons, I think what was offered in Season 3 is absolutely fine. There is an argument that the game was getting a bit too bloated and complex anyway with the recent additions, so this season seemed more grounded and modest. However, if you've enjoyed Anno 1800 for the past few years, you will still find plenty more enjoyment factor with this round of DLCs. For the casual players, Season 3 should be lower priority. In an age where Ubisoft is increasingly under scrutiny for its anti-consumer practices, stale game development and other industry controversies, Anno 1800 presents itself as one of the last shining beacons of the company, and I hope the developers continue to pour their passion into arguably the best city builder of our time. Season 4 was announced in December of 2021, so content for 2022 is a given, and based on the teaser video and developer hints, we can expect a similar scoped modest expansion in the new world this time, and military features of the base game. Anno 1800 Season 3 may not have been the grandiose content-heavy expansion pass building on from the template of the previous two seasons, but it delivers enough late-game longevity and old-world revamp for players to revisit the first original region. Whether that be shipping more, traveling more, or building up, there's sure to be something here for all Anno 1800 fans to eventually enjoy. This was Anno 1800, the Season 3 Pass Review. Thanks to our Patreon supporters for making this video possible. If you'd like to fund more reviews, please consider subscribing to us on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month.